We grew up hearing the very bold statements, boys will be boys and big boys don't cry. Toxic masculinity has been described as the silent struggle for men's mental health. And in this episode of Balancing the Bars, we join with the world in observing International Men's Day, which is observed yearly on November 19th. We honor our men and boys by delving into the issue of men and mental health. Because guess what? Big boys do cry. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Balancing the Bars. We are your co-hosts, Jimmy Sima Kalman, Abina Gomes, and Ariane Dahlia Richmond. Ladies, we are, what can I say, at the end of our journey for season one. <laughs> <laughs> Round of applause to us. And the journey has been incredible. Um, yeah. Mm, it has been a coaster, a roller coaster. And as Gavin said in the last episodes, roller coasters are fun. So Scary too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we're here and today we're talking about a very important topic. But before we get into that, our social media shout out. Yes. yes. This is like a new favorite segment that we yes. added. And our loyal followers, listeners, viewers, they get a chance to, you know, be promoted because they help to promote us mm -hmm. and today for our social media shout out again write me tiffany she said love this video this guy knows what's up with the law of attraction and going within abina is right about continuing to shine your light wherever you go and lastly, Jamisia is absolutely on point when it comes to networking and collaborating. These days, it's all about who you know. And she is referring to the episode that we did on yeah. becoming a thriving artist. What's your feedback on that? To me, there was a lot of love in that particular um, episode. And mostly when I watched it, I feel as though Gavin really honed in on what a lot of people are going through right now. There's so many people in the creative industry who are living day to day because they don't know what's up. And when he was like, hey, I'm broke, <laughs> right? <laughs> but he still, he still kept it real and I feel as though people needed that. So that's, that's what people really got attracted to. And the fact that he has wisdom regardless of going through a rough patch and he knows where he's going, he still has direction. So yeah, that was it for me. I feel as though that's what people needed to hear. I think the most important part of that episode was because it was relatable. Yeah. As Ariane said, Gavin was totally honest about the fact that he was broke. And I honestly did not expect him to say it in that way. Cause I personally, if I don't have the money, no. True. But you, True. you have to be, one with yourself and to understand this is what's going on and he also made it very clear that he is where he is today because of a tribe and because of people actually believing in him and i think that's very important for all of us and i think we understand that more than anything else because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that we have to be grateful for definitely mm -hmm. i absolutely like i thought the relationship episode was my favorite i thought the episode we did with um art and pain was my favorite but that episode was my fave because I love seeing when a man could be so vulnerable, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> That's it right there. And just speak his truth. And I feel like that episode, it was so relatable to what we're talking about today. Toxic masculinity, men and mental health. Because we have been seeing men just recently on social media just speaking their truth. And that's not, and I feel like COVID-19 just really shine a light on mental health in general, but how men really um, is affected by mental health. And these days, you got to speak out. You can't suffer in silence. And so, Gavin, if you're watching us, thank you for being so authentic and so raw and so real. We appreciated you so much. It's going to get deep today. <laughs> I love when you say that. Today. Are we ready? Are we ready? Yes, we are. Are we ready? Yes, yes we, we are. are. are we Some ready? Dora and the Explorer <laughs> vibes, okay? Yeah. We are talking about, as you said, men, mental health. And I feel like it's so amazing to 
bring this journey to an end by highlighting men. I feel like they're so often neglected. Mm -hmm. And like people often wonder like, why when it's Mother's Day or International Women's Day that you're always saying, um, or men are always saying, warm to us men, warm to us men. Like, I don't feel like it's an issue of them just wanting to impede on our shine, but it's because so little light to shine in them and the issues that they face. I often say when we look around, look at the number of women organizations that you see. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a lot. But look at, look for a men's organization. I, I feel like girl. you need to take <laughs> a, a, a lens or, or something, a mm -hmm. microscopic lens, and look for them because they are not that many, especially here in Guyana. I think that happens because a lot of times, as you said, men aren't vulnerable. So if they don't necessarily express that pain, persons don't have the interest in helping them. They always say closed mouths don't get fed. Mm. So women are quicker to express themselves and to say what's bothering them and to express what they need. That's why there's so many resources allocated to them. But I feel like men need to come out of their shell. Be like me. <laughs> come out of their shell a bit more. Have come out of your shell. Mm -hmm. <laughs> come out of their shell and be a bit more vulnerable. And then we might see society changing its perspective a bit more. So to make them feel more included, per se? I disagree completely. Uh, you said <laughs> something. You said that closed mouths don't get fed, but that doesn't mean that they're not hungry. And likewise, men are vulnerable. They're not just, sh they're not showing they're vulnerable. And when it comes to society, I mean, everything is orchestrated for a reason. And the reason why they tell men to be rocks and to always be there for someone else and like forget themselves is because that's how they want it to be. And when I say they, us, everyone, our mothers and our grandmothers and even some men, we have been conditioned as a society to put people in certain boxes and now these same men need to break out of their own boxes. And like you said, I do agree with that part though. They need to do something different in order to, for a change to be made. You know, it starts with you. So, yeah. the, the agreements and disagreements have already started. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited for this episode. But you know what's funny? I, I and sad at the same time that I've noticed that men's issues are just sometimes only attention is only brought to them when or it's only taken seriously when it's coming out of the mouth of women. In my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right? And men who are watching us, don't go anywhere because we know some of you like to say, um, how oh, y'all yeah, know what men dealing with? Mm, how can you speak for men? But well, guess what? Today you won't just be hearing from us. We have professionals joining the panel, a psychologist, right? So stay tuned. We're about to get deep. We're about to get real. real. We're about to get raw up in here. We're going to close this off with a bang. <laughs> bang, bang. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we're going to take a quick break and when we get back, we're going to be joined by some amazing men who will be contributing to the panel today. So stay tuned, don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to Balancing the Bars, where on this episode we are talking about men and mental health and as promised we have a special guest joining us in studio today mr will campbell he is a psychologist and a lecturer at the university of guyana and it's such an honor and privilege to have you joining us here today welcome to balancing the bars thank you very much for having me here oh, Yay. thank you a peaceful <laughs> and safe space yes. where of course you can be free I'm really vulnerable excited. and just release to have some fruitful conversation today. Well, it's good to have that space because usually I'm the one providing the space for yeah. my clients. And yeah. so uh, maybe you can help me work through some of my issues. Today. Ah, <laughs> no problem. You never know what may come up, but I'm pretty excited to have you here. I mean, not the fact that you're only a professional, but you're a man. And you know, 
and especially in this message that we're sharing with our people, and um, it's not only Guyanese, it's everyone from across the world are you now tapping into balancing the bars. They need to hear uh, from a man, you know, about your experiences and perspectives. So yeah, this okay. is gonna be Liddy. I got you. Word. Yes, Take it. Word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mr. Campbell, um, earlier when we started, Dahlia said something in her introduction that society has thought is that big boys don't cry. Why is that so? Why is that so? And how can we begin to shift that narrative? Yeah, you're right. Um, one of the things that, that society has taught us as men is that we should not, we shouldn't be emotional. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I do this whenever I do seminars and so on on this issue. I would ask, so who's more emotional, men, and men or women? And usually the response is, of course, women. But that is not true. We're all born, you know, with the capacity for the same emotions. Mm -hmm. And so when we're taught that um, men should not display certain kinds of emotions, it, kind, it robs men of a major part of who they are. A major con a component of their being yeah. is suppressed all their lives. And so, you know, we go through lives kind of, and pardon the expression, emotionally retarded, simply mm. because we're not allowed to express how we feel. And so men don't sit down and have conversations about touchy-feely issues. You know, we're not allowed to do that. So, you know, it, 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 it has really placed us at a disadvantage. And one problem with that is there is one emotion that men are allowed to have, and that's anger. And so whatever we feel, we just channel it through that anger. And that's, that's, you could see how that could be problematic. Yeah, and the mm -hmm. thing is that I think, Jamisia, too, we were having a conversation about this a while back. The fact that everyone has a masculine and feminine component to their being, and it needs to be balanced regardless of your gender. And that balance brings about a flow in everything that you do. So there's a bit of a mask masculine touch and a feminine touch to the things that require you know either side of you or sometimes both mm -hmm. and I feel as though um, I don't see that in a lot of men and as a woman I find that balance very attractive like I want to know that you can express yourself or even be willing to cook or clean and things that whatever you say is only for women you know hmm. I'm not even sure that it is an issue where we have a masculine or, I think we've labeled them and so mm -hmm. men shy away from that side that that would that that have, have been labeled that side that has been labeled as feminine mm -hmm. men stay away from that so for example when i was growing up my friends would come to pick me up for us to go do whatever and i'm scrubbing the stairs and they would say things like your mother guy you're doing girl work but oh. the reality is i mean work is work and, yes. and there is no such thing really and so guys don't want to do that kind of work because it has been labeled feminine but you're right in the in in, in the sense though that um those, even these emotions that, and, 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 and so on that have been labeled feminine are really part of who we are as men. And like I said earlier, we denied that part because society does not allow it. Hmm. I, I love you talking about, you know, all the feminine stuff. And I, feel, I believe that that's where the toxic masculinity, we can describe that as toxic masculinity. But before we get into that, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to have be joined by Derwin Wills, who will jump in and join into this conversation. Hey, you. Yes, you. Are you enjoying this episode of Balancing the Bar so far? Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you're loving it, be sure to share it with your friends and family as well. Continue watching. Hey guys, welcome back to Balancing the Bars. I am your co-host, Jamisia McCallman. As I said, we will be joined or we are joined by another special young man. His name is Derwin Wills. He is an advocate with interest in gender. He is a graduate from the University of the West Indies, where he studied sociology with a focus in gender and development. Darwin, welcome so much to Balancing the Bars. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, Jimmy. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome. 
now to get into the conversation, before we took a break, we were talking about toxic masculinity. And um, Mr. Campbell was sharing his views. What I want to ask both of you, or I can start with Darwin. Um, yes, we often hear the word toxic masculinity, but what I want to know is what burden does toxic masculinity um, have on men's mental health and does it, you know, intersect with each other? Good question. <laughs> Darwin, you want to start? I mean, to understand the, the burden of... Uh, yeah, sure. To understand the burden of toxic masculinity in itself on uh, men's mental health, we have to first disaggregate what toxic masculinity really means. And there are three characteristics that are that are pretty dominant. There is one, uh, control and dominance over women's bodies. There is this idea of success. And sometimes success by any means necessary. And the respect of your peers. And sometimes that respect could come through use of violence. It could come through the reduction of your peers by way of uh, sort of like infantizing or infantilizing them, or, um, you know, sometimes even the use of homophobia, which is in itself, um, you know, a weapon of sexism. But when we speak about toxic masculinity, you're speaking about those three general things, these particular traits that sometimes cut across different masculinities. The idea that men have or ought to have control over women's bodies, the idea of a man a man that a man must be successful, a man must be the breadwinner in the home, which in itself places a lot of a, a very significant burden of responsibility on male heads, even though it is not uh, within the Caribbean context. The reality, since you know there are a lot of uh, households that are held by women, and women in the Caribbean sense have come to dominate the space as being you know caregivers as well as breadwinners, etc. And the third one is this idea of of um, respect of your peers. And we see that playing out in different spaces because masculinity in itself is defined, um, there's no one size fit all. And so it's defined by race, it's defined by time, it's defined by social setting, it's defined by location. And so there are different masculinities that actually form, um, you know, across any spe specific space. But I guess we could come, come, come into that a little bit later on. Hmm. Well, yes. <laughs> you said a lot. I'll allow Mr. Campbell to um, add to that. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I agree with my with my colleague. I agree with you, Darwin. Um, and w one of the challenges we face is that those issues are narrowly defined. For example, you know, masculinity is narrowly defined. Um, respect is narrowly defined, or or I, or maybe even incorrectly defined. We don't understand respect. We don't we don't understand what it means to be masculine. So we have these narrow definitions. And like was said earlier men are under pressure to fit into these narrow boxes, these really small boxes that were yeah. created, and that is when it becomes toxic. All right, so, um, so one of the undue pressures, um, success. You know, a man should succeed at any cost, but what is success? And success, again, is narrowly defined. Mm -hmm. And so success means that, you know, you must have a, 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 a large house and a nice car and a job that is worthy of admiration. And so, yeah. so, so men are fighting to fit into these boxes that very often don't fit who they, who they, who they are, don't, don't fit their personalities, don't fit their purpose. And so... Uh, and, and so we have a lot of men who are dealing with this, you know, trying to fit into this mold which doesn't suit them and there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of frustration and there are mental health issues. Definitely. So how then do we break these molds and these boxes that I believe we as a society would have built? I like to think, and this is because I'm an advocate of good parenting, good parenting, that it is something that we're going to have to work with the upcoming generation with. I think that we're going to have to socialize our boys differently. Yes. We're going to have to, you know, it, it, uh, at mothers, women, parents in general, will have to change the approach to raising boys. And so, for example, this whole idea, as Doran said, that, that you have to be dominant and that you have to have control over a woman. You know, you grow up hearing this thing all the time, but you gotta handle, you know, you gotta handle your woman, you gotta handle your business. And, and boys are taught that at a really early age and not just by men, but yeah, also by, by women. You know, what kind of man you gonna be? How you gonna, how you gonna mind a wife? You know, that kind of thing. And so we, we have to change the way we, 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 we teach our boys. We have to train, uh, change the way we orient them. 
Um, for those of us who are, sometimes I feel like my generation is a lost one, mm. but I think that, um, I mean, I have learned some of these things, and so men my age can learn that. Yeah. We, could, we, we need to have discussions. We need to sit down and talk. We need to, you know, bring men to the table, and the way men learn is different from the way women learn. The way when men feel comfortable talking is different from the way women feel comfortable having conversations. And so rather than call a conference and, and ask men to attend the conference, it might work a little better if you, you know, um, you know, set up a screen and, 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 and watch some cricket and have that conversation while that is going on. So we have to talk. We have to change the way we, we, we orient our boys. We have to change the way we teach them. Um, and I think that gradually, maybe over a couple of generations, we might get it right. Yeah, I feel that. But, you know, there's a question you asked that was brought about breaking the boxes, but I'm from a community in the hinterland where boys are either told to get money or get more money. Hmm. And so they're basically in an environment where they're hearing this from all angles. It's just coming in in different yeah. forms. Yeah. And Doreen, what would you mm -hmm. tell boys who basically don't have any other um, source of encouragement to be themselves and they're only being told that you're like a you're like an ATM, you know? Mm -hmm. All you're supposed to do is produce money. What about their dreams? A boy like that who probably um, is scrolling YouTube and he sees this, what would you tell him if he's watching right now? I mean, I think, and that's the thing, there is a, an individual responsibility that is needed um, to really sort of, um, you know, break out of these ideas, out of these modes and so on. But it's not to place the burden solely on that individual because the way in which patriarchy operates, the way in which these ideas of, uh, you know, toxic masculinity, the way in which these socializations happen, there are multiple things happening at the same time. And so if you try to just approach it individually, it's, it would almost feel as though you're swimming against a tide. It has to be a ha all hands on deck approach where we start to understand these things from an interpersonal level, from an institutional level, and even more broadly understanding ideologically that there is a very powerful powerful idea that tells men and women how to live their lives and that a powerful idea is sometimes and most times dangerous, destructive, problematic and that is the idea of patriarchy. So for young men who are navigating this space and trying to understand themselves and where they stand within that arrangement, it is important for you to find these sort of support spaces that could help you to challenge those ideas because you cannot do it alone. But at the same time, we as a country have to work towards creating those spaces. It's not to say that there aren't conversations about men happening in different places. There are those conversations happening, but some of those conversations are still steeped in those dangerous ideas that we have. So for example, we have men's spaces, but sometimes men's spaces come to be dominated by religious ideas. And those re religious ideas could then again turn around to grown men as a dominant grouping. So then that does not help the situation, even though operating that, you know, yeah, we are here to ensure that, um, you know, man's correct place in the household or man's correct place in the family or man's correct place in society. Like all those ideas have to be challenged. And so it can't just be uh, a sort of like a one dimensional approach. There has to be a multi dimensional approach uh, towards this entire thing. So like it's not any individual uh, responsibility. What we have to do is to work towards creating more radical spaces where we can promote positive masculinities and then try to engage um, men and boys to bring them into these spaces so that we can radically define what are these ideas that have been instilled into them and this is how they should operate, this is how they should navigate and so on. And you mentioned something, um, Ariane, about, you know, people's ambitions and so on. We also use these, this idea of, of homophobia because how do you police masculinity? You police it through homophobia. And I will just, after I say this, I'll, I'll define homophobia. You use it to say that, you know, boys should not aspire to this particular thing. And so you create these narrow boxes to fit them in. But what happens when there is such a great, uh, like uh, there's no connection whatsoever to the things that you are expected to do? That is what mm -hmm. creates a lot of tensions within society. And so when we talk about homophobia, because it also it impacts how men even relate to each other, when we talk about homophobia, a lot of people think, oh, you know, homophobia is a fear of, um, you know, gay people or fear of queer people. But I think there's a more complex definition than that. And that is a definition that I love from Audre Lorde, where she says, homophobia is a terror surrounding feelings of love for the same sex and the hatred of those feelings in others. 
And when you think about that, this idea of understanding feelings of love for the same sex, it does not necessarily mean homosexual, because it could also mean homosocial. Homosocial in the sense that uh, a father and son, a co cousins, brothers, people who are engaged, men who are engaged in a strong social bond, a strong intimate bond, but not at the same time engage in a sexual bond at all. So homophobia does not... Um, it affects relationships between men, but it's also mostly affecting relationships between men that are not even sexual in any way at all. And so you see a lot of a lot of parents, a lot of sons growing up talking about how they didn't have their have a relationship with their fathers, exactly. and that is something that also has to be addressed. And because their fathers also didn't have a relationship with their fathers, and so this particular trauma continues to pass down from generation to generation. But I will tell you this: every father says to themselves. I will not be like my father. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they end up being like their father because it is so difficult to break out of these ideas when in, for, in the terms of imagining, this is literally all you know. Ah, mm -hmm. that was deep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, that felt like a spoken <laughs> word kind of vibes. That was deep, but, yeah. but it is possible. It is very possible. It is possible. It is possible. Out of the stupid cycle. It's stupid to not love your family and it's stupid to not love your friend who's always there for you just because you were told that you're not supposed to express love because you're a man you see it's a little more than not loving that person is not yeah. being mm -hmm. is not feeling safe to able express to express that it. love mm. right that, that mm -hmm. is, that, yeah, that's true. And, and that is that is a big part of the issue that we as men face the the fear of expressing what we feel we we, we shy away from that because feelings are said to be uh, feminine so we don't want to express yes. feelings and 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 it, it it becomes so bad it's not just that we don't want to we, we we never learn how to we never learn how to 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 express feelings and so whenever you I, I don't know if you've had this experience but you start to cry your man start your man panics because he he doesn't know how to relate to that expression your girlfriends would all come around you and somebody can buy ice cream and you're gonna have a talk men we don't know what to do <laughs> You know, we get confused. <laughs> yeah. but, even, yeah. but even as a woman, uh, my masculine side, before um, I started really looking at myself, was saying, you crying? Don't cry, don't cry. Don't, don't cry, cry, exactly. Cry. And you just Stop like, crying. And then, and, then, then, yeah. and then all your emotions kind of do. <laughs> but after constantly mm. doing that, I think it's important. And if you're watching this and you know exactly what I'm talking about, after doing this a lot, it gets full and it bursts it at explodes. a time that you don't even expect it to. And for a man, that explosion <sighs> yes. is usually an angry explosion. Mm. It's an explosion, explosion of mm -hmm. anger because it's the only, it is the only emotion we're oh familiar my. with. It's, the only, it's, it's an emotion that has been nourished over time. Let me, let me you, when, when a man gets angry, um, you know, I think it was Malcolm X who said, you know, get, you get feelings, nobody listens to you. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. You get angry, people listen. Mm -hmm. um, uh, men have heard from women, he's so sexy when he's angry. Uh, you know, those things. And so that has been, mm. has been rewarded, it has been nourished. And, and men are okay with being angry because that is masculine. No. And so we channel everything th through that, which is familiar. Just mm. may I, before you go ahead, I just had a meme in my mind. I think it will connect. You bottling up your feelings? Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, so what were you going to say? <laughs> Sorry, I was going to say that sometimes it's also... <laughs> you wanted to say something, darling? Yeah, I was going to say that sometimes, I mean, outside of outwardly expressing anger, as part of the internalizing of that anger, men sometimes withdraw. And when they withdraw, they withdraw into themselves. And sometimes it will put them into this deep contemplative space where they're not really partaking in things that are happening around them. But I remember there was one time I was having, um, or sometimes they isolate. I remember there was one time I was having a conversation um, with a guy after a men's forum. And he was just so grateful to hear different perspectives about how men navigate this space. And he said, you know, he had gone through something that he felt was entirely traumatic, um, where he was in a, he was in a marriage and uh, his wife had, had, had cheated on him. And she had spoken about it to him. And I mean, this is just understanding the real experiences that men navigate at the same time. Not to say in any way that there is any form of, 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 um, 
of what's the word I'm looking for? It's not support. It's justification for violence against women. There's absolutely no justification whatsoever for violence against women. Right. But he was saying that when he first found out, when his wife told him that she was cheating on him, he said he just he felt like he was going to do you know something really terrible, and he said he just got up one morning at about two o'clock or three o'clock, and he said from where he lived, he didn't say where he lived. He said he just walked. He said he walked until he couldn't walk anymore. When he finished walking, he found himself at Starbrook Market. Oh my gosh. Hmm. So these are the these are the types of things that happen. It's a lot of energy. Hmm. But it's a redirecting of that energy. But there's right. still a need for, because sometimes all you want is a good cry. And guys mm-hmm. said that to me before. Like at that same event, like it was about five of us in a circle. And one of the guys said, Brother, I just want I just want some place to go and cry. Because I scream by myself anyway. But I just want right. to be able to to actually say that these things happen and I don't like how these things happen. But mm-hmm. when we force men to engage in that sort of psychic self-mutilation, like if you're chopping off an essential part of yourself, you are, then right. it makes them less than human. And so masculinity right. in itself and toxic masculinity is inherently dehumanizing because it takes away from men the thing that makes them human, which is their an emotional connection. Right. Jamesia and I are in our fields. <laughs> I can't thinking of all the times where, where I've um, done youth camps. I've spoken to the boys in the camps and they were like, you know, I couldn't draw at home. And they're amazing at art. And, mm-hmm. and they just weren't allowed to do that in their spaces. But I feel as though, wow, today, uh, Jamesia, come on, I'm speechless right now. You, I want to go back a little bit like earlier because we were talking a bit about mental health as well and earlier Dali you mentioned something that where you're from in the hinterland community that you know boys are just thought to um the the success Mm -hmm. the the ATM situation and I believe that Mm -hmm. all of these things can be contributing factors to to a, a man's mental health because one you're thought that you know you need to be the breadwinner you need to be the, the, the dominant one. But mm-hmm. when you can do these things, like it contributes to, okay, I'm failing as a man. A man. Mm-hmm. So how can we, <laughs> I don't know, shift that? Like, it's okay to not, like, and like Darwin said earlier, it's the, the, the religious standpoint. Because when you're trying to shift the system, it comes back to the religious standpoint. Where in the Bible it says that men need to be the breadwinners of their home. So how can we teach men to navigate these situations even when, um, you know, they feel like they're failing because of the standards that society would have set? I think we need to redefine success and redefine yes. failure. You know, I was, reading, I was reading a piece somewhere about a nurse who worked in palliative care and she, she'd interviewed a number of persons on their deathbeds and she said not one of them on their deathbeds would say something like I wish I had made more money or I wish I'd spent more time at work or I wish I'd taken my career to another level it was always I wish I'd spent more time with people I wish I'd connected with my ch- more with my children I wish I had nurtured my relationship you know so the, the, so so we we have to redefine failure because of the uh, success and failure because at the end of the day those things that we pursue as success those are not the things that really matter and and and, and you're correct mm-hmm. um, and, and that, that doesn't only happen in the hinterland if for example a boy has finished school and he says to his mother you know what I want to I want to I want to go to school so he's 22 and he's or, or, or 21 and he's he's at university and someone asks him you know he has a girlfriend and maybe he meets her parents and, and they say okay so what do you do and he says I'm going to school yeah there's that dead yeah, silence there because Im- Im- immediately, I mean, he going to school, he ain't making no money. How he gonna mind she? Mm-hmm. So you know, and and, and, some, and we wonder sometimes why it is that at the university women outnumber at, uh, uh, men about uh, what is that number now? Six. Uh, I, I don't remember the, the numbers exactly, but more than fifty. It's, it's a lot <laughs> more than fifty. <laughs> you know, so um, so. Boys feel like they, they can't go to school, you know, because they got to work, they got to make that money, and, and there's that pressure. Now, when that happens, and somewhere down the line, he can't, he can't move up, he's not, he's not upwardly mobile because he's not uh, certified or certificated, depending on, 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 on who you are. Um, you know, so, so, so he's depressed now because he wants to climb that ladder, he wants to do better, and he can't. And, 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 and so these same people now who'd been pressuring him to go make money when he was 21, 
when he's 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 35 or, or 38 people are saying you know you, you, you're not making any progress yeah you know you're not making any progress oh this is where you were when you were 21 so so, so there is that pressure Darwin also mentioned and uh, as a mental health practitioner I, I picked up on that he, he, he mentioned the issue of men sometimes internalizing that anger and withdrawing into themselves. And, and the, it, it is a really difficult place to be when you're angry at yourself and you don't even have the words to express to yourself what you're feeling. And that very often leads to depression, which is a, a serious, or, and, and, and anxiety, which, which are serious mental health issues. Mm. Uh, and there are a couple of other things also. That? Yeah, and I mean, there are a lot of other things also that spill off from, from you know, this, this performance because masculinity in itself is a performance. Yeah. <laughs> and the interesting thing about masculinity as a performance is that nobody ever gets it right. So, because <laughs> it's, it's always changing. It's so always, always changing. Like there is, you're always frustrated. Mm -hmm. But I remember there is one particular case and I think, you know, there are some things that deserve, um, that deserve examination. And this case has stayed in my mind for a while, and that's a story of of of, um, of Elton Ray. I don't know if you, if folks remember a couple of years ago with the the bank robbing incident. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the thing about it that was so difficult for me is that very quickly, because I mean, when when it, when it first came out that you know somebody had tried to rob the bank, etc., people had an idea in their mind of what the robber looked like. In their right. mind, they imagined somebody who was unemployed, refused to work, lazy, more than likely black, almost always black. That was the expectation, and that this person, you know, just didn't want to go out and get a job. And then the facts of the story started to come out, and it forced us to rethink a lot of the ideas that we assume about what you know, these sort of crimes looks like, because there was this guy who seemed to have been living a reasonable life, studied mm -hmm. um, outside of ambitious. Guyana, had his mm -hmm. degree, had his vehicle, ambitious. Um, he was, you know, working at a, at a, in the public service, making a good salary. So what was it that really pushed you to, to, to actually engage in something like that? And we, when I asked that question, I asked us to also think about crime and this idea of success. And how in some cases, as a form of coping with this expectation, more these, these societal expectations, it pushes us to consider certain things that we would not have otherwise considered. And so when I ask us to think about that, I ask us to also think about what happens in spaces like, um, and I mean, I've lived in, I lived in Leopold Street for a couple of years, spaces like Leopold Street and the Agricolas and the Sophias and so on. These spaces where, you know, this specific type of masculinity develops, which is an urban black masculinity, but which is also informed by other things that happen more societally. For example, um, limited job opportunities, mm -hmm. stereotyping that happens, which further oh, yeah. limits the opportunities in the community. You look at the surrounding spaces and you see education systems that are not fully developed. So it's a lot of societal pressures that kind of boil down mm -hmm. on people in the community, but further boils down even on the men in the community to really force them to do things that, that, that otherwise would not be considered because they see it as sort of like a last resort. And then it becomes their bread, how they make their daily bread. And so there's a need for us to really understand everything that we do in this country through gender. So understand crime through gender. And when I say understand crime through gender and masculinity, it's not just, okay, crime is happening in this community. Let's go and take some footballs. Let's take some cricket bats. Let's take some basketballs mm -hmm. because all they need is some sport. No, to do the solution to, mm -hmm. to, to, to poverty is not sport unless you're giving them a scholarship for them to go and further their studies or to go and excel and become part of some broader, broader league, you have to come with more holistic solutions within these communities to really deal with these issues, which when you trail them all the way back, goes towards the societal expectations. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Thank you so much for that, Darlene. As we begin to wrap up, I'm just going to give you guys the opportunity to, you know, summarize <laughs> all that you would have shared in a we, we were just getting started. <laughs> <laughs> we'll bring you guys back, don't worry. Uh, we were just getting started. I, I, I think that um, there are a couple of things that have come out of this, and I, I let Darwin do his own summary. But um, I, I think that we need to change the way we socialize our boys. We have to change the societal expectations, because Darwin was right. It's not just about what I think. It, there, there's an enormous pressure on me to be to fit into a particular mold and so we're going to have to change that 
mold or maybe just do away with molds to yeah. to begin with and, and just and with. just let people be you know because we <laughs> we are our best selves when we're allowed to be um, and so yeah. we, we, we have to get get rid of those molds we have to retrain we have to redefine what it means to be a man and broaden that definition so it includes every type of masculinity except the toxic ones of course yes. um, and 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 <laughs> you know allow men to be men their way you know Ooh, I like mm -hmm. that <laughs> ding 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 and I, yeah. I love that we're talking about the like toxic masculinity and you know getting away with it I feel like in this season of where we're wearing masks mm. it's time for us to strip off the mass of toxic oh, masculinity yeah. and work towards Ooh. having positive mm. masculinity mm -hmm. you know so Darwin I will give you the opportunity to you know just summarize all that you would have shared with us today mm-hmm was it my turn? Yes, Dara. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think, um, and I mean, spaces like this are so important to get people together to talk about these things. And I'm so grateful to Dr. Campbell, to Jamesia, and to, uh, to Arian for creating these spaces and to really have that full conversation. Because mm -hmm. even though, you know, we, and... Abina. <laughs> so, Oh, sorry, Anabina, because even though, you know, we sometimes have these conversations, these conversations are not sustained. And we've had a lot of rich conversations about, you know, violence against men and girls, against women and girls. And I'm also part of a lot of those conversations. I'm also part of the UN Spotlight Initiative. But at the same time, when we talk about, you know, the, in, the inclusion of, of, of men and boys into the space, it's usually um, post-violence against women. Mm -hmm. Without... There, I don't know if there are any any strong programs that exist right now within the space that is Guyana that sort of works on men and boys before they even get to that space of engaging in violence against women and girls. And that is something that is so important. So we need to create not just the spaces for men and boys to engage and to understand themselves as gendered, but we also need to create the programs and the budgets and the funding that is necessary so that organizations could do, could do that work more holistically. Because it's not just about giving men condoms and telling them, listen, you need to just do more safe sex. <laughs> it's not just about that, but it's also helping them to understand themselves as social beings within a world that tells them that these are the things that you are limited to, stay on the path. And if you don't stay on this path, we will use homophobia against you. <laughs> Wow. wow. Thank you to Mr. Campbell. Thank you to Darwin who joined us virtually. We're going to take a quick break and when we get back, we're going to wrap up. <laughs> you did the... I was trying. I don't ever get it right. I don't ever get it right. I don't know how to do it either. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome back, guys, to Balancing the Bars. You heard from some phenomenal men today. The conversation was deep. And as I said, just how we do it here in Balancing the Bars, raw, authentic, but Keep most importantly, area. fruitful. And we trust that you guys would have, you know, something resonated with you. As you said earlier, this season has been quite a roller coaster mm -hmm. with my girls, but I wouldn't have it any other way. And I'm happy for us to, you know, be able to end it with such a discourse, such a discussion. It was needed. It was needed. Um, but guess what? Next week, we're going to be back with our recap of the season mm -hmm. so be sure to go in those comment sections let us know what was your favorite part of season one what was your favorite episode and guess what one lucky follower might just get to join us virtually Ooh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I, I feel like it's important to reward people um for the support that they would have given you and also we have Definitely. some giveaways coming your way but it is all, brewing. All, all of that will come in it's our brewing. in our <laughs> recap episode but it is time to go and um i'm gonna allow dahlia to take us out today we don't want to leave 
<laughs> but I feel by speaking our truth and sharing experiences, we have carved a path forward. And we have a lot of learning, unlearning, and relearning to do. But we must allow men to be human. And humans, regardless of their race or gender, do have emotions. And emotions are to be felt and expressed healthily. So to all the men and boys out there, we say, don't be afraid to laugh out loud, cry out loud, and be vulnerable. Do not suffer in silence. Seek the help you need because contrary to popular belief, big boys do cry. And thank you all for watching and listening to another episode of Balancing the Bars. Share your views with us in the comment section because we can't wait to hear from you with Balancing the Bars, where balance brings peace. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.